Let's look at the central limit theorem for proportions. We flip a fair coin 10 times. We usually call this number n. It's the number of trials. Suppose we want tails for some reason. Because the coin is fair, the probability of success, that is the probability of tails in a particular flip, is 0.5. We usually call this number p. It's the probability of success in a particular trial. Suppose we get seven tails. Find the proportion of successes. Well, seven successes in 10 trials is 0.7. We usually call this number p-hat, uh, that little arrowhead above the p, we pronounce that p-hat. Uh, p-hat is the proportion of successes, and again, in this case, that's 0.7. So the probability of success in a particular trial is p. p-hat is the proportion of successes in you know, n trials. We flip a fair coin, n equals 10 times, and calculate the proportion of tails. What does the distribution of p-hat look like? Here's what it looks like. Because when you flip a fair coin, a coin with a 50-50 chance of coming up tails, yeah, a good portion of the time, you'll get 5 out of 10 tails. In other, in other words, the proportion of success will be 0.5. But even when the coin is fair, sometimes you'll have a 40% chance, 40% uh, uh, successes, or 60% successes. Sometimes 30% or 70%, in other words, 3 out of 10 or 7 out of 10. Sometimes when you have n equals 10 trials, you might only have two successes or eight successes. Sometimes you'll have a probability or a proportion of successes equal to 0.1 or 0.9. Now, it could even be 0 or 1, but those are so unlikely that you can't even see them above the x-axis. So again, the probability of success is 0.5, but, well, sometimes when you, when you flip the coin 10 times, it doesn't always come up five tails. It just doesn't work out that way. We flip a fair coin n equals 100 times and calculate the proportion of tails. What does the distribution of p hat look like? Well, here's what it looks like. Notice how this is different. This one tails off by the time we reach 0.3 and 0.7. Now, with the other one, you could see it above the x-axis at 0.1 and 0.9. Here, you can't see that. It, it isn't even above the x-axis at 0.3 and 0.7. Now, technically it is. It's just that it's so close to the x-axis, you can't see it above the x-axis. How about we flip a fair coin n equals 1,000 times and calculate the proportion of tails? What does the distribution of p hat, the proportion of successes, look like? Here's what it looks like. Okay, now here's the question I have. What do you notice about the shape of the distribution as the sample size n gets larger? In other words, the shape of the distribution of p hat. Well, it gets thinner. Okay, here you notice it's thin, it's narrow, it's spiky. And it approaches a normal distribution. The one that we were looking at earlier is kind of pixelated, right? I mean, look at this. It's like Minecraft, whereas this one is much smoother. Uh, again, it's approaching a normal distribution, that familiar bell-shaped curve that we saw earlier in the course. One way of summarizing this is the central limit theorem. In this case, it's just for proportions. Suppose the probability of success in a trial is p, and we conduct n trials. Then p hat, the proportion of successes, has mean p and standard deviation square root p times 1 minus p over n. And the distribution of p hat approaches a normal distribution as n approaches infinity. Wow, that's a mouthful. Okay, let's apply this. We flip a fair coin n times and calculate p hat, the proportion of tails. Find the mean and variance of p hat when n equals 10, n equals 100, n equals 1,000. Okay, for n equals 10, the mean of mean of p hat is just going to be p, uh, which is 0.5. In fact, the mean of p hat is always going to be p, which in this case is 0.5. The standard deviation of p hat, that's the square root of p times 1 minus p, so that's 0.5 uh, times 1 minus 0.5 over 10 under the square root sign, so it's the square root of 0.5 times 0.5 over 10. In other words, square root of 0.25 over 10, which is square root of 0.025, which is about 0.158. So that's the standard deviation of that distribution, that first distribution we saw, when n equals 10. On the other hand, when n equals 100, again, the mean of p hat, proportion of successes, is still going to be 0.5p. In this case, the standard deviation, the only thing that's different is that instead of having a 10 down here, we have 100. So it's 0.25 divided by 100, which is 0.0025, which it works out to be 0.05. And then lastly, when n equals 1,000, the mean of p hat is still going to be p equals 0.5. Standard deviation is now 0.25 over 1,000, uh, which works out to be 0.0158. So notice what we have. 
When n equals 10 or n equals 100 or n equals 1,000, the mean of p hat is, again, always going to be p. That's just 0.5. But the standard deviation changes. Because you've got the n in the denominator, the bigger the value of n, the bigger, the larger the number of trials, uh, the smaller the standard deviation. So when n equals 10, it's 0.158. When n equals 100, it's 0.05. And when n is 1,000, it's 0.0158. Notice, too, that when n decreases by, when n increases by a factor of 100, notice here, 1,000 is 100 times as big as 10. Uh, that doesn't mean the standard deviation decreases by a factor of 100. Instead, because of the square root sign, uh, the standard deviation only decreases by a factor of square root of 100. In other words, square root of 10. Uh, square root of 100, which is 10. Uh, so notice it goes from 0.158 to 0.0158. So when you increase the sample size by a factor of 100, you decrease the standard deviation by a factor of square root of 100, uh, which in other words is 10.